Welcome to the Rock Newman Show from the campus of historic Howard University, located in the nation's capital. I'm Rock Newman, and it is my desire to inspire you with personal stories of extraordinary achievement. Anti-racism activist, feminist, and LGBT rights advocate, Jane Elliott has tackled racism head on for almost 50 years. She speaks to white people in a way that surprises some and makes others uncomfortable. Here she is at a workshop that was recorded for the 1996 documentary, Blue Eyed. I want every white person in this room who would be happy to be treated as this society in general treats our citizens, our black citizens. If you as a white person would be happy to receive the same treatment that our black citizens do in this society, please stand. You didn't understand the directions. If you white folks want to be treated the way blacks are in this society, stand. Nobody's standing here. That says very plainly that you know what's happening. You know you don't want it for you. I want to know why you're so willing to accept it or to allow it to happen for others. Welcome to the Rock Newman Show. Thank you so much thank for you. being well, here. Well, thank you for inviting me. That was a rather powerful clip that we just played there. No one stood. They never do. Which means that it's not ignorance. Ignorance is not why they didn't stand. Ignorance isn't why they didn't stand. Why did, why, how come they didn't stand? They didn't stand because for the first time in their lives they were being honest about what they are. They do not want to be treated the way people of color are treated in this country. In fact, they don't even realize that they are people of color. They think there's a difference between white people and people of color. White is a color. We're all members of the same race. Now when I do that, instead of saying that, I say, well, every person in this room who considers himself or herself a member of the white race, please stand. They all jump up with great delight. People of the rest of those colors sit there and look at them. Then I say, well, all the people who, who consider themselves members of the black race stand. Black folks stand, brown race, brown, yellow race, red. Everybody's standing. I say, now, will all the people in this room who consider themselves members of the human race sit down? Everybody sits down, and then they look around like, oh my God, we just admitted something that we didn't know. We are quite certain that there are four or five different races on the face of the earth. There aren't. There's only one. It's the human race. You and I and everyone here, are, we are all members of the same race. It's time to get over this idea of several different races. I don't do that anymore. I ask them to stand if they consider themselves members of the white race. And we're going to try to get into all of that today. Just prior to doing so, it's important for me to try to make sure that my uh, viewing audience gets a full-bodied picture of Jane Elliott, who you are and from whence you come. I want to say this. I remember as a six-year-old shining a very dark black guy's shoes and my very light-skinned grandfather told me, don't, don't ever allow me, don't you ever let me see you shining a nigger's shoes again. My grandfather was as prejudiced against, as a light-skinned black man, was as prejudiced as, against dark-skinned people as the most racist Ku Klux Klansman was. Tell me about your parents and your upbringing. My father said, never judge a man until you've walked in his shoes. Hmm. My father said, a fair thing is a pretty thing, and a right wrongs no man. Now, something that happens may impoverish you, it may anger you, it may frustrate you, but it won't wrong you. A, a fair thing is a pretty thing, and a right wrongs no man. And he said, never tell a lie. And he never told a lie. I never heard my father tell a lie. I don't know that he ever did. He, li he said, a man's word is his bond. He said, do not judge people by the, their color. Do not judge people by the way they look. See what they're like inside. Do not judge other people. And he was very, very, very careful about that. And he was born in the 1800s. Well, how old do you think I am? Now, I know you sent a wheelchair to meet me yesterday. I didn't need that. Either. And you gave me My help. Yes, I did. 
No, my father was born in 1905, 19, 1907. Uh-huh, okay, okay. Yeah. 1909, okay. I'm sorry, 1909. My mother was born in 1912. And my, but my father had a father who was an absolutely moral human being. Mm -hmm. And my father was an absolutely moral human being. I was raised with a Catholic mother, Irish Catholic mother, and an Irish Protestant father. So we had war in our house all day, every day. So you had a strong moral Absolutely. underpinning as a child. Yeah. Uh -huh. My father would say, you know what's right. You know what's right. Do what's right by God. That's what you have to do. Do what's right. Do the right thing. You know the difference between right and wrong. So that sense of fairness in a time where, when there was rampant legislated and legalized racism, did, that, did, did you all ever express those opinions or do you know if your dad you know, uh, ever was an activist Rice back in No, 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 time? Riceville was an all white town. Well, all white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the worst thing he could do was do what my father did, which was marry a Catholic. Mm -hmm. so, the, so we were an all, he wasn't, he had no prejudices, but if he did have them, he kept them to himself because he didn't want his children to be raised the way some of the people in that community had been raised. Mm -hmm. No, he said there's a right way to do things, do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So let's jump, let's jump where ahead. You're a third grade school teacher, April the 4th, well, between that and April the 4th, 1968, mm -hmm. my husband and I lived in Waterloo, which was called Little Chicago because of the large black population. Uh -huh. My husband ran a store in the black section, and we found out during that time that all the things that we had been told about black people were lies. We had been lied to dreadfully because the way people of color acted, black people acted in that situation were nothing like we had been what told had to expect. Told? Oh, we had been told, they, oh, well, everybody knew that they lie, they cheat, they steal, you can't trust them. All these ugly things that were told in the white community. And as, as a matter of fact, these are things that are facts. They were all lies. Mm -hmm. We didn't realize that. We had been fed those stereotypes all our lives. And here we get to Waterloo and his best customers, most of his customers, practically all of them were black and they were all wonderful. He had one black employee and this was in the 1950s, Jim Jackson was going to high school, then he, he left high school and get, was going to college. So he left the store. My dad, my husband called Anna Mae Weems, who was the head of the NACP there, and said, I need a black employee. She said, Daryl, we're gonna pick at your store. He said, get me a black employee. National T wouldn't let him have more than one. He said, get me a black employee. She said, I don't want you to have a black employee. I wanna pick at your store. So his store was the first one picketed in Riceville, Iowa, in, in the Waterloo, Iowa, during the civil rights movement. It was just fascinating what we learned from that experience. We knew what Waterloo was going to explode, so we got out and we back, went back to Riceville where it was comfortable mm -hmm. and where we didn't have to worry about taking sides because we knew what sides the people in Riceville were going to be on. So did you leave, uh, uh, so did fear make you leave? Is that what? We didn't want to take sides in that battle that was coming and we knew it was going to be ugly. Mm -hmm. We knew there was, you lived on the north side or the west side or the east side. Mm -hmm. and if you lived on the east side and the north end, you were black. Mm -hmm. Now that has been regentrified, mm -hmm. so that now those lovely homes yeah. in that section are no, now yeah. occupied by white folks. Mm -hmm. And people of the black folks have had to move out, whether or not they could afford to, because they wanted those that lovely area for somebody else now. We're doing it all so over the United you, States. You went back to Riceville. We went and, back to and, Riceville. And, and what was, again, and, still an all-white, oh, comfortable Oh, absolutely. Comfortable still is. Mm -hmm. Still is, except for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was the only... Oh, well, that's a long story. But anyway, yeah, I went back there and my, my sister was retiring, was retiring for her job, mm -hmm. resigning because she was adopting a child. So I went in and applied for the job. And I got her job because the superintendent thought if he, had, if he was losing one Jenison, he'd get, gain another one. Mm -hmm. Well, what he found out very shortly was I wasn't my sister. And prior, tell, tell me about your activity in the school did you do any sort of uh, racial justice kind of stuff, fighting white supremacy before the Martin Luther King incident? Martin Luther King one is, was one of our heroes of the month in February, every year, mm -hmm. along with, unfortunately, George Washington, who owned slaves, bought and sold people for money, mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln, who refused to free the slaves, mm -hmm. Davy Crockett, who, was, who died while he was killing, killing off Mexicans while we tried to take over part of their land. Mm -hmm. That was racist teaching. I would not have accused myself of teaching racism, but I did. Mm -hmm. That was the curriculum that you taught. Mm -hmm. I taught the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So what I was doing was not educating, I was indoctrinating. Mm -hmm. That's what we do in the schools in this country. We call it education, but we indoctrinate students. We teach them how to be good Americans. 
we teach them a lie in order to guarantee that they're going to be good Americans. And they believe the lie. What's the lie? The lie is the superiority of white people. It's a lie. It's a flat out lie. I didn't, I think maybe, we, I thought we had stopped until I talked to my seventh grade granddaughter in Washington State a year ago. They were learning about the Williams Massacre in which, as she, as she explained it to me, a, a group of Indians killed a white missionary. I said, is your teacher going to tell you about the Mountain Meadow Massacre? She said, what's the Mountain Meadow, Meadow Massacre? I said, it's when the Mormons sent a group of Mormons out to kill all the members of a wagon train that were coming through Utah. They, they killed every member of that except one young girl, I think, may, uh, survived. The soldiers went out, found these cavalry went out and found this wagon train with all these dead people knew that the Indians hadn't done it, talked to the Mormons, and they said, yes, we did it. I said, ask your teacher if he's going to tell you about the Mo Mountain Meadow Massacre. She called me the next week and said, Grammy, you got me in a lot of trouble. I said, what happened? She said, I, I raised my hand and asked if we're going to learn about the Mountain Meadow Massacre, and the teacher took me out in the hall and said, Mir uh, Grace, we don't talk about that in this school. I can't teach you that, because if I did, you wouldn't be a good American. You wouldn't love America anymore. I went ballistic. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is not teaching. This is not education. The word education, to educate some, someone means to be in the act of leading them out of ignorance. You don't do that by indoctrinating them. That child was being indoctrinated. That made it tough for that teacher after that because what he said no longer had fact behind it. She didn't, she didn't believe him as much anymore and she shouldn't have. You know, I had this question much further down in the interview, but based on what you just said, I, I'm going to introduce it now. And that is, is the attempt at the eradication of racism an endless merry-go-round? It doesn't have to be. If I mean, we were, it's so pervasive. But it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. I gave a speech a couple of weeks ago. I can't remember where it was. And after it was done, a young black man came, a white man came charging at me, young, charging at me and said, you have freed me for the first time in my life. I'm freer than I have ever been. I do not have to support these stereotypes anymore. What a wonderful thing to have happen at the age of 20. It could have happened to my father. My father watched the first film that was made in my classroom by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. The first time he did the exercise, the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise, it was just the kids and me, but then it got out. Yeah. And the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation came down and filmed it the next year. I showed that film to my father, and I had never seen my father cry since the death of my three-year-old sister when I was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And after that film was over, he, with tears in his eyes, he said, I wish somebody had taught me that when I was nine years old. Mm -hmm. Think of all the years yeah. of idiocy yeah. that he wouldn't have had to live through yeah. if, he had, if some teacher had said to him at the age of nine, there's only one race, and you and I are all members of the same race, and every... We are all members of the family of man, and we're going to treat one another like family members. Sibling rivalry is one thing, but racism based on a lie, that's idiocy. Okay, and I asked the question also, because in nature, power never willingly concedes anything to the powerless. Unless you're in the situation that the United States is in right now, and the situation that people like Ben Wattenberg are scared to death about. You, know, you need to realize that within 30 years, white people will have lost their numerical majority in the United States of America. And white men say to me, every time I do the, or give a speech, every time I do it, somebody comes up and says, well, if people of color, as we have been trained to teach those who are other than white, if they get power, aren't they going to want to do to us what we have done to them? And do you think that that is the root fear? Right now it is. That pervades the land, and especially in a very high profile way, the political landscape. Donosaurus T. Rump is trading on that fear. What's his name again? <laughs> I call him Donosaurus T. Rump. Mm -hmm. because he is like a rump, no doubt about it. I'm furious about what he's doing. And he is trading on that very fear. When he says we're going to keep those people from south of, from south of the border out of this country, he is trading on that fear okay. of the loss of white power. I want to come back to that. I want to come back to that. Because we, are, we only have one segment to do this show, and Thank there's you. so very much to do, let's go to that fateful day. Uh, uh. April the 4th, 1968, um, Martin Luther King was assassinated. 
I suppose we have to, don't we? Yeah. I hate to talk about that because it makes me sick to remember that day. It, I get sicker remembering that than I do remembering the day my little sister died. Because you see, for me, Martin Luther King represented hope. He really did. I thought, because he wasn't working for the betterment of black people, he was working for the betterment of all people. Mm -hmm. That's what he was about. Mm -hmm. And for me, hope is an acronym for holding on to positive energy. Mm -hmm. And that's what he was doing. He had been one of our heroes of the month in February and assassinated, not shot, didn't die, wasn't killed, he was assassinated deliberately because he, what, not because he was doing something about racism, mm -hmm. but because he ran the Poor People's March on Washington. Mm -hmm. yeah, he'd gone, he had gone beyond. And when he did that, mm -hmm. he was going to upset the economic situation in this country. We knew we could deal with racism. We could, we could perpetuate that indefinitely. But when he went after the economic situation, that scared us. And Martin Luther King Jr. signed his own death warrant when he did that. And he knew it, but he did it anyway. Mm -hmm. I was going to have, we were studying the Indian unit at the time. We were going to paint the teepee that my previous year's students had made. We were going to put it up in the classroom. We were going to paint it within, go, anyway. I took the teepee home that night. I walked in the door. The telephone was ringing. I answered the telephone. And my sister said, is your television on? I said, no, why? She said, you better turn it on. I said, why? She said, they shot him. I said, who'd we shoot this time? She said, Martin Luther King Jr. I can still remember. It's just one of the worst things that has happened in my life. Because he was something great and good and more important than either of the Kennedys and more powerful than either of the Kennedys. I, 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 hate, to, I hate to remember that day. So I washed the teepee and spread it on the living room floor and started to iron it. And then it got worse. I watched Walter Cronkite interviewing three letters, leaders of the black community. And he said to those black males, when our leader was killed, his widow held us together. Who's going to keep your people in line? As if JFK was the leader only of white folks. I was furious, absolutely furious. So I changed the channel. And there's Dan Rather saying to three leaders of the black community, don't you Negroes think you should feel sympathy for us white people because we can't feel the anger at this killing that you Negroes can? I was, I was appalled. Up until that night, God had looked like Martin Luther King, like a, Walter Cronkite to me, yeah. uh, obviously. Mm -hmm. Old white man with a long gray beard that looked like Charlton Heston playing Moses. Obviously, that was Walter Cronkite. All of a sudden, I had no respect for either of those men. How dare they ask those two questions of those black men? They were absolutely offensive. I couldn't believe it. And at that moment, I decided that the next morning, our lesson plan for the day was to learn the Sioux Indian prayer that says, O great spirit, keep me from ever judging a man until I've walked a mile in his moccasins. I decided that the next morning, if my students didn't understand what we were talking about when we talked about the killing of Martin Luther King Jr., not only was I going to teach them that Sioux Indian prayer, I was going to arrange to have it answered for them. I was going to do what we do in this country. I was going to pick out a group of people on the basis of a physical characteristic over which they had absolutely no control. I was going to say ugly things about them because of that physical characteristic. I was going to treat them as though all the ugly things I was saying about them were absolutely true. Mm -hmm. I was going to lower my expectations of them. I was going to force them to live down to my expectations of them. And when they did, I was going to say, see, you're like that because of that physical characteristic. Now, I've been doing that. At that time, I had been doing that for over 33 years mm -hmm. as a citizen in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. I know exactly how to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm a white woman. Mm -hmm. I know from birth, prenatally, we know how to treat those that we want to put down. And we do it all the time. Mm -hmm. We give lessons in that in school. I decided that the next morning, I didn't know what physical characteristic to use. I couldn't use height. I was the only tall one in the room. Couldn't use age for obvious reasons. Refused to use weight because we do that all the time. Mm -hmm. Couldn't use hair color, it's too easy to change. Didn't want to use gender, We sexism is rampant. Mm -hmm. I decided I would do what Hitler did. I would treat my students positively or negatively on the basis of the color of their eyes. I didn't know how this exercise would work because I'm an ignorant white female. Yeah. I don't know about racism. Yeah. So before I went to bed that night, I said, the only prayer I ever say anymore, oh Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. I said it over and over like a mantra. Within 15 minutes after I started that exercise the next morning, I learned something really valuable. You better be careful about what you pray for. You might get it, and you might find out that was precisely what you did not want. What does that mean? I didn't want to know how I look to people of color. The minute I separated my group according to the color of their eyes, and I put, that year I put the brown-eyed people on the top, I think. Yeah, brown-eyed people were on the top the first year. Mm -hmm. Immediately, 
in, I told the kids, blue-eyed people are, are, aren't as smart as brown-eyed people. They aren't as civilized. You can't teach them anything. They aren't as clean. Immediately, little brown-eyed Debbie sitting in the front row looked up at me and said, how come you're the teacher here if you got them blue eyes? Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, you little, wasn't a nice thing I was thinking. Mm -hmm. And then a little boy spoke up and said, if she didn't have them blue eyes, she'd be the principal or the superintendent. They're both brown-eyed. They immediately took it that they must be brown-eyed because they had power. They were powerful males, so they must be brown-eyed. Mm -hmm. Immediately, those kids began to treat me the way they had learned to treat people who were inferior to themselves. They treated me as they, I found out how it feels to be tolerated. Before that exercise, every day before that exercise, they admired me, some of them feared me mm -hmm. because I don't mess around. Yeah. But that day I found out how it feels to be tolerated. Mm -hmm. In this country we use tolerate to mean put up with. Mm -hmm. They put up with me, they just barely tolerated me. Until in the afternoon when I pulled down the map, the wall map, and the ring slipped off my thumb, the map went around and around and around the ruler, and I said, well, I've done it again. Little brown-eyed Debbie sitting in the front row once again said, what do you expect? You've bl got blue eyes, haven't you? Mm -hmm. And as God is my judge, I have never felt like this about a child before and only one since. I could see myself in my mind's eye, and I can still see it. I could see myself backhanding that little brown-eyed witch against the wall. Mm -hmm. I wanted her to hit that wall and slide down like a broken egg, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be at the bottom when she got there. Mm -hmm. I learned about anger. Mm -hmm. I learned about violence. I learned about my own thin veneer of civilization. Mm -hmm. I learned about self-control. I learned about what a rotten teacher I must be to think that way about a child. And I thought, oh my Lord. I knew there were teachers who felt that way about some of the fractious boys in school all day, every day. Mm -hmm. I knew from being in Waterloo that there were teachers who felt that way about black males, particularly black males, all day, every day. Just a wholly transforming experience. It was, it was like, your life will never be the same, fool. You did this to yourself. Now your life will never be the same, mm -hmm. and it never will. And um, in the immediate aftermath, <laughs> I um, have come to understand that you found yourself in the teacher's lounge. <laughs> oh, yeah, I went down uh, to the teacher's like a, lounge at noon. Uh -huh because I needed some, some support. I thought, surely, if I describe this to the other teachers, they'll understand it, right. and they'll help me to understand it. Mm -hmm. I went to the teacher's lounge, or a number of teachers in the lounge, including the other two third grade teachers, one of whom was about 54, and the other was over 60, had been molding young minds for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. I told them what was happening in my classroom the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. When I finished telling them, the younger of those two teachers said, I don't know how you have time for all that extra stuff. It's all I can do to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. Well, she hadn't taught reading, writing, and arithmetic yet. She might as well have done the extra stuff. The other one said, and I'll never forget, I can still see her sitting there. She said, I don't know why you're doing that. I thought it was about time that somebody shot that son of a No teacher frowned. No teacher said, God is love. Mm -hmm. No teacher said, in so much as ye have done it unto one of these my brethren, so have ye done it unto me. Mm -hmm. No teacher said, judge not that ye be not judged. Nobody said, thou shalt not kill. Every one of those teachers either smiled or laughed and nodded because she had expressed their there feelings perfectly. There was pervasive acceptance. A absolute acceptance, not only acceptance, approval. She had said what they wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And I left that room determined that no student of mine would ever leave my presence with those attitudes unchallenged. I may not be able to change your attitude, but I can challenge your attitude, and you have to prove to me that white people are superior, and if you tell the truth, you can't do it because it isn't true. And I've done, I was done teaching the lie at that point. So you developed the Blue Eye, Brown, brown Eye project. I copied it from Hitler. I'm not proud of it, but it worked. And your goal in fostering that curriculum, if you will, was what? My goal was simple. I wanted my students to be less ignorant than I was, where race is concerned. Mm -hmm. that's a, that's, I'm an educator. The word educator comes from the root duck deuce, which means lead, mm -hmm. the prefix e, which means out, the suffix a, a t e, which means the act of, and the suffix o r, meaning one who does. I'm an educator. It is my job to lead people out of ignorance. I'm not a teacher, I'm not a trainer. I'm an educator, and I think that's extremely important. You got criticized. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you get uh, two professors of education oh, yeah. in England, who I'm sure are your best friends, uh, Ivor Goodson and Pat Sykes. They argue that your blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise was unethical, 
psychologically and psychologically and emotionally damaging. And your response? And if they believe that, that, what, that what I did is unethical, psychologically and emotionally damaging, I want them to tell me why they allow it to be perpetuated where children of color are in England and in the United States 24-7. If you think it's wrong, then put a stop to it. Okay. You have further, and we're going to show a clip in just a moment. Um, after, I, after I present this to you, we're going to show a clip, and then we're going to have you to come back to respond. You've been accused of scaring people. I do that. Humiliating children. I don't do that. Being domineering, angry, and brainwashing. Here's a clip that some people try to use to support that language. Now, getting right along, your hand is still up. You still didn't learn anything, did you? Didn't I just say when your hand is up, you are thinking of what you're going to say instead of what's being said? Didn't I just say that? Yes, you did. And did you hear that? Yes, I did. And did you decide that you were just going to do it your way? I was. Wait a minute! You were on a roll yes, there. Yes, I did. Yeah, thank you very yes, much. Yes, I now, did. Now, since you choose to not listen to others, what do you suppose we're going to do where you're concerned? Not listen to me. Thank you very much. May now, I finish what now, I'm saying, no, please? because you're still thinking of what you're going to say instead of what I'm saying. Now, getting right along. I heard what you well, were saying. Every, you're doing I it again. What you were you're saying. doing it again. I don't care. You're doing it again. It's wrong. You're you doing it again. Persecuted her for standing you're out. You're doing it again. Persecuted him for standing out. The only change that ever happens is when people stand out, and I am not my fault. Martin Luther King Jr. was shot. Are you in any physical <laughs> danger here? Are you in any physical danger here? Is that girl in any physical danger here? And your question is? Here's, here, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what my question is. Was that an example? There's, there, there's someone else who works in the, I'm going to say the field, I won't even say the arena, because there's a difference in what you do. His name is Tim Wise, and he talks about white privilege. Was that an example of white privilege one, and two, uh, I've heard you have take exception with Tim Wise and some of his presentations, if you could answer both. Well, number one, I'm not going to discuss Tim Wise, mm. because as far as I'm concerned, what he's talking about is not white privilege, it's white ignorance. Mm -hmm. White people have the right to be ignorant and to insist that they be allowed to remain ignorant, which is the reason I wear this shirt. Prejudice is an emotional commitment to ignorance. Absolutely, and we want, to, we want to maintain our prejudices. And if you think we don't, then you look at what has happened with President Barack Obama. He would have been an extremely successful president, but we, we white folks have the right to keep him in his place, and that is what we have managed to do with that fine, brilliant young man. Now, I may not agree with everything he has done, but it isn't because of the color his, of his skin that I disagree with him. But it was and is, and the Many of the members of the House of Representatives and the Senate said that that's exactly what they were going to do, was stop that, ma that black man from being successful as President of the United States. Now, that's not white privilege, that's white ignorance. That's willing to let this country go down the tubes in order to support their own ignorance where skin color is concerned. What was your question? Uh, I, I went back to whether or not that oh, was white privilege. That wasn't, white, that, privilege. that wasn't white privilege when I did that to that young woman. Mm -hmm. That is what white teachers do to children of color all day, every day. She had it for one day. All the rest of those blue-eyed students in that room got the same treatment. You need to also re remember that those stu students got an hour of college credit for being there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and my question really was, uh -huh. is how she behaved. Uh, how was, she, oh, was, how she behaved was, was I'm going, it's going to be done my way because I'm right. I'm white and I'm right. But you need to realize that she came in with an attitude yeah. I recognize attitude, I'm not stupid. She came in with an attitude and it was going to be, I'm going to upset this. Well, nobody is going to upset this any more than Martin Luther King Jr. was allowed to upset this. Mm -hmm. Nobody is allowed to upset the exercise because I, as a white woman, woman, not because I'm privileged, but because I am trained to keep, to take control in the situation and to keep order and to force people to do what I want them to. She left 
The others who were being abused stayed there and took it and learned from it. She refused to learn. One of the listening skills is good listeners decide to learn something. She decided not to learn something before she came into that room. Having her leave, however, was extremely important for all everybody else. Mm -hmm. As one of the black participants said, if she hadn't left, the mes if she hadn't left, the message might not have gotten across. We learned when she left. She said, "I get treated this way all day, every day, and I can't leave because there's no place I won't get treated this way." Mm -hmm. But the way when she left, that sent a message to the people of color in that room. Yeah. White folks can't take it, but we take it all day, every day. Mm -hmm. She couldn't take it, even though she was getting an hour of college credit for doing it. You, you, you say white folks have a have a right, have a right to remain ignorant. Seem to. You have gotten death threats. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Tell us about. Well, that, that. used to frighten me, but after Uniontown, Pennsylvania, when three carloads of blacks took me to the Pennsylvania Turnpike going just as fast as they could to get me out of town because the teachers with whom I had done the exercise in the morning called the superintendent and said, superintendent and said if you don't get that out of town we're gonna shoot her so they got me out of town I woke up when in Harrisburg this? oh that was in probably 74 75 mm -hmm. okay. and they got me out of town because they said they kill people here so they, mm -hmm. they didn't want me to be one of them mm -hmm. I was scared then Mm -hmm. And the next morning when I woke up, two days later, all alone in a, in a motel in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and knew that in behind one of those sliding glass doors, those windows in that motel, might be the person who was sent there to shoot me, I stopped and stayed in the room, closed the door, and thought, now you have a decision to make. This is what Martin Luther King lived with for the last three or four years of his life. You can stand here and be frozen with fear and never do this work again, and I had four kids at home. Or you can walk out that door and take your chances. So I put my purse over my shoulder and I took my luggage cart handle in my hand and I opened the door and I stiffened my shoulders. I guess I thought if my shoulders were stiff enough and my mus muscles were stiff enough, the bullets would bounce off. And I walked quickly to the checkout desk mm -hmm. and checked out. And when I got there, I thought, you damn dummy, look what you've done. You've allowed them to scare you to nearly to death. I will never do that again. I will never be frightened again. You cannot scare me. If somebody threatens to shoot me, now my husband died two and a half years ago. He was the reason for my living. We had been married 59 years. He died. Now, if somebody threatens to shoot me, I say, go for it, fool. And so today, you are as committed. Some people say I should be committed. <laughs> but yes, yeah, yeah, because things are getting worse now instead of better. We are going backward drastically in this country on a daily basis, and people don't seem to realize it. Or if they do realize it, don't seem to care. Or want to, as Ronald Reagan said, he wanted to take us back to the good old days, the 50s. Those were good for white men. They weren't worth a damn for people, so-called people of color or white women, but they were good for white men. That's where he wanted to take us. And he did in, in many ways. And now we have somebody running for the presidency who is determined that he'll take us back to that. And in worse ways, you cannot criticize every group that is other than white Anglo-Saxon male and expect a whole lot of people to go along with what you say. But evidently, you can't expect them to because they are. Yeah, I certainly, part one of my questions was going to be, what does it say about the state of race relations in 2016 when Mr. Trump is as popular as he is and drawing the kind of crowds and the adulation. What does his candidacy say about racism in 2016? It says that, it, it, this is exactly what people are saying. Now we're gonna get, men that, get that black man out of the White House. Anybody is better than having that black man in the White House. We might even put up with a woman in the White House as long as we no longer have to look at that black man in the White House. That's what it's about. It's about the fact that we have we continue to perpetuate the myth of white superiority and the myth of the uh, all these ungodly stereotypes, negative stereotypes that we have where black people are concerned. If you read the book uh, Killers of the Dream by Lillian Smith, everybody should read that book because it tells you where this thing got started. But First, you need to read the myth of race and realize that there's only one race on the face of the earth. 
you and I are members of the same race. We all have the same great, 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 great grandmother, and she was a black woman. So if we could just get over the idea of there being a number of different races, we could, we could solve this problem. We could teach, we could educate people instead of indoctrinating them. It has not been good for us. White people think it has been good for us. It has not. The kinds of, con the kinds of confrontations that you see between people, uh, so-called people of color and white people in this country aren't necessary. They don't have to happen. Every time I do the exercise, and I've done the exercise oh, probably a thousand times, every time I do it when it's over, I say, and with my students, I say to my students, would you like to have discrimination day again so you could be on top again? And without exception, they say, no, I don't ever want to treat anybody and make them feel the way I did the day I was on the bottom. I don't want to put anybody else on the bottom. If we could do some empathetic education instead of what we're doing, we could change this thing in two generations. I'm absolutely certain of that. My former students are different from their peers because they've had a different day, two days in their lives, have made their lives different for the rest of their lives. And that's a fact. Explain that. Develop that more. Well, for instance, so in the, the, the film that you see, The Eye of the Storm, mm -hmm. all the kids in that film are not mildly to severely dyslexic. They came into me reading at the first grade level. Now, if you hadn't started to drink, drink I wouldn't. <laughs> Power of suggestion, it works every time. <laughs> now, and if I yawn, you're going to fall asleep. Anyway, so the, these kids came into me, me reading at the first grade level. The principal gave me my class rule and said, these kids are nothing but duds, 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 pass them on, get them out of here, they'll never amount to anything anyway. They aren't going to learn to read. I looked at their cumulative files, their math scores are a lot higher than their reading scores. I figured I've got a whole room full of dyslexic kids, oh my lord. No principal, no principal has ever done me such a favor because I know how to teach the dyslexic child. I, teach, I could teach that chair to read if it had a mouth. Mm -hmm. I know how to teach the dyslexic child. So I told the kids, here's your problem. And they had been called the dummy group. They put them in my room, they called them the dummy group. I told them, here's your problem. I know how to teach you your problem. You're all going to be able to read at the fourth grade level before you leave here. They looked at me like I was crazy. I wasn't crazy, I know what I'm doing. By the end of the year, they had had the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise. And on the day those kids were on the top in that exercise, they read words I knew they couldn't read and they spelled words I knew they couldn't spell. And the same thing had happened the first year I did the exercise and the second year, and this is the third year. It was absolutely amazing. At the end of the year, those kids had made from two to four years growth in reading, four or five years growth in reading in a single year. Now, if you can make nine months of growth out of nine months of work, you've got an average child. Some of these kids made four years of growth out of nine months of work. Those kids were brilliant. Mm -hmm. Three of them had been identified as mentally retarded by the Iowa Crippled Children's mm -hmm. Clinic. Mm -hmm. They weren't mentally retarded. Mm -hmm. They had a different learning, they had a different learning dis difference. They had a difference, and I knew how to teach to it. Two of them, one of them had a language all her own, had been in speech therapy for five years. Yeah. One was a stutterer. Those problems disappe disappeared in my classroom, partially because of the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise. The day they were on the top in that exercise, those kids found out how really smart they were. And nobody was ever allowed to call them dumb again. One of them is now a lawyer. So I didn't succeed with all of them. He's just a lawyer. But I did the best I could. <laughs> one of them is now a junior and senior high school principal. Mm -hmm. And he just quit that job and went on to something else recently. Mm -hmm. Two of them were on a, a, a program about brain science. They mm -hmm. called them out and took them out to just uh, last fall, mm -hmm. took them out to California to have them be on this thing about brain science. Let me ask you, the, what impact and effect did your work have? You said your husband was your reason for living. Yeah. What effect did it have on, has it had on your family? Well, it's been awful for my kids. Um, my parents lost their business. They owned a restaurant in a hotel and nobody would eat in the restaurant that was owned by the people who raised the town's only N-word lover. Only they didn't say N-word lover, they said, what you say? Yeah. Uh, my kids were beaten and spit on and their belongings were stolen. They were abused by their peers, by their teachers, and by the parents of their peers because they had an N-word lover for a mother. And I, if I had known what was going to happen, I still would have done the exercise, but I would have warned my kids ahead of time. I didn't warn them. They didn't realize. They didn't know why. They took it personally. Obviously, they would. And I had to tell them, this isn't about you, kids, it's about me. Mm -hmm. They couldn't beat up on me. Yeah. They couldn't get me fired. Every year they tried to. <laughs> it, was, it was interesting. It was very interesting. And you look back on it and you think, ignorance personified. I'm talking about ignorance here. And fear. 
fear of what is different. If I'm on, if I am right, the other fifty-three teachers were wrong. Yeah. You can't have that happen. Mm -hmm. So they had to prove that I was wrong. I wasn't wrong. Had, did they ever implore you to, Mom? Hey, this we're suffering. Stop what you're doing. No, they never talked to me about it. They never talked to me about it. I didn't realize what was happening. I knew that I, when Brian came home, and beat, I came home from school and he'd been beaten up mm -hmm. by five high school kids. He was in junior high. He didn't run home fast enough. Mm -hmm. And five of them caught up with him. Two of them, three of them got out and beat him up. And the other two stayed in the car, one to drive and one to watch for me coming home. Mm -hmm. And I called their mothers. One of their mothers said, your kid got what you're, you've been asking for. What did you expect to have happen? I went to the teachers who were abusing. The kids were being abused at the junior high level. And the teacher said, you thought you should have thought of this before you did that exercise. The art teacher, who was the wife of the elementary principal, said to me at a teacher's meeting one day, Jane, get your kids out of the school. These teachers are trying to destroy your children. And that's when we, we moved away from Riceville. Mm -hmm. We moved to Osage. Because I now, I, the kids didn't tell me about it. The teacher told me about it. She knew what she was talking about. I got the kids out of there. Mm -hmm. But I continued to teach there. So I was still, I was still the, the fly in their ointment. But the kids didn't have to take any more abuse. Regrets? I regret that I didn't warn the kids and that I didn't know that that was a Christian community in name only. Mm -hmm. That's my major regret, that I didn't tell the kids, here's what I'm going to do. But I didn't know what was going to happen. I couldn't have told them because I wouldn't have believed it. If someone had told me that people in that community in which my great-great-grandparents were some of the first settlers would be treated that way by those people who had known me and my family for years, I wouldn't have believed that. I couldn't believe it. It was beyond belief. Those, you know, church twice on Sunday and once in the middle of the week. That's what those teachers were. And then this is what happened. I no, I. My one regret is that I didn't, I didn't get my kids out sooner. When you meet a white person on a plane that might be a long flight, do you ever talk about what you do? And, and if so, what do you say to them? Well, number one, when I get on a plane, I get a book out and read it immediately if I can, because I don't really want to talk to that person. I'm usually in most until recently, I've been in first class because they put me up in first class because I'd fly so often. Mm -hmm. And the person next to me is not somebody who wants, they're usually tall white males. Mm -hmm. And they are not somebody who wants to have their grates shaken. And I don't choose to do that on the airplane because mm -hmm. that's a confined space. Mm -hmm. So that is not how, if somebody says to me, I think I know you, yeah. I say, and? I want to talk about what you do, and then I talk to that person. Mm -hmm. But I'm not on that plane to educate those folks. They mm -hmm. aren't paying me. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly part of, part of what I hoped happened as a result of inviting you here today was that all of the viewers would be, would be educated. And I'm curious as to what you would say to one, one of the guests in the, in the studio here studio here today, or I should say a few, are white individuals. Mm -hmm. And here in 2016, you've gone through your blue eye, brown eye. You've gained this, you know, incredible experience and reputation. You know, you've been on, you've been on, the, you've been on the Oprah's, you've been on the Ellen's and the rest. That's not a big deal. Get over the fact that I've been on television. Mm -hmm. Any fool can get on television, and a mm -hmm. lot of fools do. Mm -hmm. Before I was on the Johnny Carson show, he had a man on who shot a Coke machine because it didn't give him his, his right change. <laughs> so, <laughs> and somebody else trained chickens and rabbits and turkeys. Uh -huh. And then they invited me. Uh -huh. And I said to John Carsey, this is not a big thrill. You need to know this is not a big compliment uh -huh. in, in view of who he had last week. You said week. any fool can get on television. I'm going to try to remain not self-conscious. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but... Take it personally if you choose to, but if you read the book, The Four Agreements, mm -hmm. you won't take it personally okay. because it wasn't meant right. about you right. Right. unless you no. act like a fool and then I'll let you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then that'll be your fault, not mm -hmm. mine. But no, having anybody can get on television. Mm -hmm. The problem for white folks is white women jump on a project and they'll stay with it for two years. And if it doesn't change, then they'll jump, on, jump onto another project. That's what we do. You just said white women. I'm saying white women, uh -huh. because white women have the power to do a whole lot of things because, number one, they're white, and my, most of them are attached to a significant white male. Uh -huh. 
so they can do things that a whole lot of other women can't do. Okay. You know that, and I know that. Okay. So I what, have stayed so, so with what, this what, project for 50 years, almost 50 years. And what do you want those white women to do you were just talking I about? I want them to get on something and make it, ma make it matter and stay with it until you make the changes. Just because you get tired, because it doesn't, isn't working right, don't stop. Persist. If what you're doing is right, keep it up until you make a difference. You might not make any friends, but you might make a difference. We weren't put on this life, to, on this earth, to su serve as ciphers. We are put on this world to make a difference, in my estimation. And I think that every educator could make a difference in the level of racism in this country. Every single one. We have these kids for six to seven hours a day for nine months of the year. We could have changed the level of racism in this country since I did that exercise. We could have changed the level in the, of racism in this country. We have something we know works, but we don't want to do it. And when I went home that night and told my mother to my mother's restaurant and told her what was happening in my classroom, she said, Jane, you better be careful. You don't want to end up where Aunt Eunice did. I said, where did Aunt Eunice end up? In a mental institution. What I was describing in my classroom that day, happening in my classroom that day, sounded insane because I had created a microcosm of society in my third grade classroom. And those kids behave the way we behave in this society on a daily basis. And to her, it sounded insane because treating people positively or negatively on the basis of a chemical in their skin is a mark of mental illness. We are not, we are not acting in sane ways. Do you absolve African-Americans, no. blacks, of a role of advancing race relations? No, I don't. I, I don't absolve them of their responsibility. However, if you have been trained prenatally to believe in the superiority of one group of colored people and another group of, of, uh, on the inferiority of another group of people of color, and white people are just people of color, get over it. If you have been trained to behave, believe that, and you've passed all those tests in school that indicated that you believe in the belief and the myth of white superiority, how could you act other than the way some of them do? How could you act as though you didn't believe it? How could you not be a racist toward those who were either too dark or too light after the kind of doc indoctrination that we've offered you for 13 years if you stay in high school? All those years you've gotten the same indoctrination. How dumb could you be not to believe it? I mean, you'd have to really not be very intelligent. Let's talk about, the, for a moment, the role of religion oh. and a um, Caucasized Jesus. <laughs> uh, well, you can call him a Caucasized Jesus. I don't know what you mean by that. Uh, blonde, blue-eyed yeah. symbol that we've well, so seen for so I long. I tell college students now, how many of you send Christmas cards? Well, I send Christmas cards. Do I send fewer? Oh, boy, I'll tell you how to do that. Go down to the store and buy a box of Christmas cards with the Holy Family on it. Take it home and color them right. Jesus did not look like the little Pillsbury Doughboy. Mary did not have blonde hair, blue eyes, and pale skin. They were in the Middle East, and she was a Middle Easterner. And in the Bible, it says Jesus had feet of bronze and kinky woolly hair. Color them right. Send out your Christmas cards. Next year, you won't have to send out a third as many because you won't get many Christmas cards. We don't, when you sit in a Methodist church, as I did for years, and you look at that brown, light brown hair on that picture of Jesus at the front of the church, and then you get those Christmas cards, and you think, how does anybody believe this nonsense? How long can we perpetuate this myth? We'll perpetuate it as long as white people have the numbers and the power to do that. And we have that now. As long as white people determine the curriculum, it will be a curriculum that teaches the rightness of whiteness. And you ascribe that to a sinister motive? I ascribe that to ignorance. I ascribe that to ignorance. You believe what the teacher says. My dad said, you behave in school. If you make a fuss in school, you'll get it when you get home. Behave yourself in school. Learn what you have to learn. Pass those tests. So that's what you do. You don't question. If you question, you aren't going to pass the test, you, so you don't question. That's what we teach people to conform. You've been doing this a real long time. Doesn't like, seem long to me, but maybe <laughs> to you. Like to think for a second, like you think for a second, 
and tap into, given the work you've done and what you tried to accomplish, what's been your biggest disappointment? Oh, probably when my mother kicked me out of the family because the nobody want nobody's comfortable when I'm around. Uh, we were a very our, the brothers and sisters were really close because that's all we had. There were seven mm -hmm. of us. We had no money, mm -hmm. so we had each other. We were a very closely knit family, and then I wasn't allowed to be part of that anymore. That was a disappointment. As far as the exercise not being taken on. That's not a big disappointment because I know how scared teachers are. Mm -hmm. Scared are. Teachers are scared to death that they'll lose their jobs if they try something new. And now that you have computers and every kid has a computer, teachers' jobs are really on the line now. Mm -hmm. So it's a really risky, a risky thing to do things that are out of the ordinary. What's my biggest disappointment? Donosaurus T. Rump. I'm going to come back to that one more time. So am I. I'm going to ask you, though, what's been most satisfying in this work? The About fact this that Raymond and Rex, two of my former students who were in the film, The Eye of the Storm, were called to California as members, former members of the dummy group to be in a documentary about the science of the brain. Why now, is that most satisfying? Because they didn't live down, after they were in my classroom, they refused to live down to other people's expectations of them. The elect, the, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was one of my, was one of the most satisfying things for me, mm -hmm. what he did. Mm -hmm. And then the election of Barack Obama. I saw young black males walk straighter and taller and more confidently the day after that, uh, that election. The day after he became president of the United States, they changed the way they walked. I was absolutely thrilled to death. He could not have been elected if he didn't have a lot of white folks voting for him also. Did you ever look at that and say, well, maybe what I do had a little bit of impact oh, on what was perceived to be advancement? No, and let's not, let's not go there. No, no, what, what I do is not that big a deal. What I do had, has had very little impact as far as I'm concerned. I wouldn't dream of taking okay. even a smidgen mm -hmm. of the responsibility for where Barack Obama, what Barack Obama became. Mm -hmm. I thought for a while we had grown up a little. But Barack Obama was a great community organizer. And Sarah <laughs> Palin said all he was was a community organizer. Mm -hmm. It takes a good community, community organizer to be become president of the United States. I watched how he organized. Mm -hmm. Mitchell County, Iowa mm -hmm. was absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. That had nothing to do with what I do. It had to do with what he knew how to do. And he did it well. Mm -hmm. Twice. You've mentioned uh, in, a, in, a, in a rather disparaging way Donald Trump a couple of times. And um, many are saying that Donald Trump is the embodiment of the failure and the advance, the lack of advancement for racism. So here's what I want to get. Here's what I want to do. I want to give you this opportunity to have a conversation or at least for right now he won't speak back to you but for you to speak to Donald Trump we've got not we've got one minute to close this show and you speak to Donald Trump and tell him what he should be doing and what he shouldn't be doing look number one I wouldn't speak to Donald Trump if I met him on the street. <laughs> and he would not take advice from me because I'm an old white woman. I know what I am and I know what he is. He does not belong in the presidency. He doesn't have the skills for it. That takes a lot of brains. It is not a place for a businessman. You do not run a country the way you run a business. Particularly in the fact, in fact, view of the fact that so many of his businesses he didn't run. They were run by other people who knew what they were doing, and that's the reason they succeeded. What he tried to do, run a business, okay. failed. Right. We, can't have fail we can't afford to have a failure in the White House. Are we you had that. Are you ever going to retire? Am I going to retire? Mm -hmm. I retired a long time ago. From this work that you're doing? Oh, now. oh, well, I'll stop doing this work when racists stop behaving in racist ways. I figure I've got 50 or 60 more years to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I, 
I would love to, oh God, I'd love not to work anymore. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what it would be like in this country? And I know what it would be like because after the exercise is over and my kids get together, yeah. and after the exercise is over in a, in a corporation and yeah. people get together, all of a sudden there's a feeling among that group that was never there before. I make yeah. families out of students. Families out of students. That's what we could do in this country. We could become together. the family of man. Thank you so much for joining us You're here You're most today. welcome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for Thank having you. me. Folks, that wraps us for this evening. For more information on this program or any other program produced by WHUT, go to whut.org. Goodbye and God bless.